So today's workshop, uh, first we'll be going over some concepts. There's a vocabulary, vocabulary that we are using. Um, one of the issues that I found, well first, uh, I've, been, I've taught here in Beirut from 2004 to 2016. AUB and AUST, um, and there was some, there was, uh, grew up in the States, like I said, now I teach in Canada, and there are some issues particular to each of these places, but we will be talking about how they overlap. So uh, what I found in my teaching, especially when we're talking about protest or resistance, that there's often a lack of vocabulary, um, how we speak, the tools we use are the same tools that are used by those who oppress or those who uh, put us down. So attempted here is a way of avoiding such tools and such means. So concepts, a few case studies, uh, a vocabulary. Um, we'll be talking about an artist collective that I started in 2009 called Jamaliyat that's still in existence. It was started here in Beirut. There are some particular issues concerning the collective that came into focus while we were working on it. And then as a kind of group project, we'll break down into groups and we will work on an analysis of a particular case study. What I will be talking about, what you have in your hands in terms of materials can be used to talk about cultural production, an organization, uh, artwork, journalism, articles. So the cultural production that I'm mentioning happens to be anything. Um, but the analysis of it takes a particular, particular form. We'll be talking primarily about colonization, decolonization. Decolonization is a big buzzword right now in North America, and it has taken on a meaning different from how we understand it here in this region. So for the past uh, 20 years or so, I've been researching resistance and protest discourses, usually in the form of artwork. I've been teaching illustration, printmaking, and graphic design, and I've seen a progression from the days back in the late 60s, early 70s, when we were talking about liberation movements, now we talk about decolonization and indigenization. What I'm attempting to say is that these are the same thing. Even though the word decolonization today is used differently, and we'll talk about why that might be so. Two scenarios, acculturated colonization. Here in Lebanon, um, Students often educated outside of the national language, for example. Uh, I'll get into this a little bit more, but I also want to talk about, we often think only here in this region, only in South America, only in Africa, these are the colonized countries. I'm trying to say today, I'm living in Canada now, Canada is a colonized country. What is this one? Canada is still part of Canada is a colonized country, it's still a crown colony, it defines itself as part of the Commonwealth, meaning United Kingdom, and this takes particular form. So I'm making a comparison to what we often internalize here as being colonized, and I'm saying it exists there as well. Uh, many of my students, many of the activists I work with feel a sense of alienation, from home, from community, from their known culture, searching for identity, but this is often based on dominant cultural categorizations, not on anything essential to them. Pressured by national, pressured by national and nationalistic mythologies, especially in North America, and we end up performing, I call it uh, minstrelsy, which is a very particular term, but performing for a dominant culture. So here in Southwest Asia, North African region, what are the symptoms? Rejection of national language, 
bourgeois identification with foreign imposition, what I call NGOization. How many, Aranya, how many NGOs in Lebanon? Like one for every 500 people are we at? And we used to joke if they took all of that money that the NGOs bring in and just passed it out to everyone in Lebanon, we'd be much better off, right? Um, adhering to national or nationalist mythologies, what does it mean to be Lebanon? Does anybody even question the idea of the nation state? When, when I find myself saying Bilad al-Sham or Damascus country, this becomes hugely problematic uh, to certain parts of the population. Is it Ba'ul and Ibn al-Bilad al-Sham? becomes a, a problematic political stance to, to say now as opposed to before. And here we have denigration of outsiders and working nether classes. Nonetheless, we have a very active and vibrant cultural resistance. And I have some examples here. By this I mean to say that the colonization here is within a minority. And the dominant are minority those dominated a majority, and they carry on with their cultural production um, as best as they can. I'm comparing this to Canada, and I'm going to engage in what I call reverse orientalizing, where I'm taking Edward Said's orientalism, the idea that we end up being defined by the West, quote unquote West, uh, in a way that we take on. I find myself in Canada now and I get into, I'll call them discussions <laughs> with my colleagues. Oh, you over there and this and that and the other thing. And I say, my response is, you here. You here in Canada. The assumption that this is a universal or how they see the world, that it is universal, needs to be questioned. And so one, one of the things that I notice most about living in Canada now Absence, absence of communal culture. There's no street culture. This is tactical. So unlike New York City, where I spent a good part of my life, where you can go to Brooklyn and find the Arab community, and it presents itself as such, or Patterson, New Jersey, the largest community of Palestinians in the United States, you go there, they call it Little Ramallah, right? Dearborn in Michigan. You have a sense of being in that community. In Canada, it isn't so much the case. There's a distance here. So even in a television show called Kim's Convenience, which is about Korean immigrants, the television show, the audience for it is Anglo-Canadians. It's not necessarily the Korean community. We'll come back to this. So a little bit of context, what this led me to do in 2009 when we started Jem al -Yed, I wanted us to, how do we come back to speaking, acting locally in a local way? How do we use the culture, the language, the tradition of what is local to best advantage? How do we avoid traps of co-optation? By co-optation, I mean working in a way that allows the dominant mode or the dominant culture to take what you've done and use it against you, or use it in a way that undermines what you're saying. And the, the collective, I should say, was created in spite of the power structures that were designed to keep such groups from forming in the country. Just a few pictures of our work um, over the years. Uh, Brooklyn, the Corniche here in Beirut, uh, UNESCO Palace, we did a, we curated an exhibition of posters, a Burj al Barajne camp. Um, this was the march to the border, uh, but the, the posters we did were, we can see on the front of the truck here. Um, but what you notice here is a lot of hands-on. We're gonna talk more about what it means to, to uh, have our work be from our hands, our mind, and our heart. Getting back to decolonization, um, 
when I use the word decolonization, I'm going back to the original liberation movements of the 1960s and 1970s, right? Um, what we're hoping to do, what they were hoping to do, establishing a new cultural norm outside of the dominant, right? A desire to move away from explanatory or defensive positions, meaning always explaining, always in a mode of, well, you know, reactive uh, to accusations and things of that nature, and hoping to recapture the energy of that time. I think the point is driven home. These, uh, uh, this presentation originally was presented in Canada, so these are examples of protest and resistance in Canada. I include them to show this relationship between a dominant mode and those who are outside of that mode eventually always leads to protest. So it's, it, to me, this is proving the thesis Canada, United States, Europe, they tell you you have free speech, but there always comes a moment when people stand up and say, well, you know what, we don't, and we're gonna show you that we do. We're going to make you listen to our voice. So we see this happening now in France, we see this happening in uh, Sudan, we see this happening all over. The liberation movements of the 60s and 70s, they were globally separated. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have a way to connect with each other. But there was intersection. If I think of something like the Lotus Magazine, the Asian African Writers Association, for example. Um, I'll show some examples later of intersection between activist movements around the world. The basis for the liberation movements, efforts, efforts to reclaim identity, land, language, culture, but not in a nationalistic way, in the sense of we are isolated from the world in a bridging and uh, in a way of organizing with other people. And we have terms that I like to use, such as indigenization, intifada, insurrection. Uh, this was a series of posters we did in our collective. Again, this idea of how do you activate people as opposed to speaking and having them be on the receiving end. All of the work we did, we put it online for download, and these images were used on the television, on billboards, on signs, the whole ride down to uh, the Mesir al You can see our billboards everywhere. Um, People took them, colorized them, added text, but it was a way, to me this was a collective effort as opposed to us beaming out or sending out a message that absolutely had to be uh, received in one way. So in today's workshop we'll be focusing on how do we, how do we come up with a vocabulary outside of the dominant discourse? How do we update an approach such that it is outside of given tools, given methods? And how do we move away from the dominant voice and return to what is local, grassroots, popular voice? In one of the handouts I gave you, there is, this is explained in greater detail. Um, on the left, I have some terms, there are some notes, and I have some uh, examples as well. I'm using the example of Hurricane Katrina that devastated New Orleans. Um, what we need to know is that the narrative of Hurricane Katrina was basically, and this is an American narrative, those who suffered had this coming to them. This was their doing. This was their fault somehow. You were living in the wrong part of town. You didn't leave when we told you to leave. Well, forget about that. Forget the fact that these are people without money, without cars, without ability to take buses out of the city. 
Not only that, but those who did attempt to flee and cross the county line were met by police with gar armed with guns and weapons, and they were forced to go back. So um, Katrina take, took on a very particular narrative within the, uh, within the American framework. There were some particular moments, though, that I'm focusing on here, which broke out of that narrative. One, and no matter what we might think of him today, Kanye West was on a uh, fundraising television program, and he went off script. He had a prompter. He was supposed to be reading what, was, what, what he was supposed to deliver as a speech, and instead he went off script and he said, it took you five days to come down. People have been dying for five days. Where, what took you so long? And he ended up by saying, George Bush doesn't care about black people. All of the news footage, all of the local video that was taken by uh, residents of the flooded wards of New Orleans, ended up being used in a particular way. I apologize, the, equal the quality here is not great. I'm just gonna play a little bit of this video. This was done outside of, it's on YouTube, but it was done outside of the music industry, outside of dominant record labels and that kind of thing, okay? Motherfucking attic. Can't use the cell phone. I keep getting static. Dying because they lie instead of telling us the truth. Other day, the helicopters got my neighbors off the roof. Screw because they said they're coming back for us too. That was three days ago. I don't see no rescue. See, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. Since God made the path and I'm trying to walk through. What? Swam to the store trying to look for food. Corner store's kind of flooded, so I broke my way through. I got what I could, but before I got through, the news said police shot a black man trying to leave. Okay, so we get a sense here of an original off-script statement made on television being taken, used in a video that, uh, a music, a rap song that compiles video footage challenging the narrative. And then finally we have 10 years later, almost in a way of correcting the dominant mode coming back and going back to this word co-optation. George Bush officially presenting 10 years after Katrina passed through a kind of revision of history, talking about what happened at that time. So I have three terms here. One, non-mediated, meaning what is unscripted? What is the unsaid? What is uh, the subaltern voice? Submediated means speech or expression that goes against the dominant mode. And this is compared to supermediated, or expression that is designed to keep the status quo, to keep the dominant mode in place. Uh, a little bit more analysis and some more terms. Uh, recently, Telesur, English, the Venezuelan, well, pan-national pan television station from South America uh, on Twitter, they posted something saying that Facebook has taken down our page for the second time this year. 
please spread the word and help us get our page back. The response, you have freedom of speech. And we'll talk about why this is a contradiction uh, in this sense. So five terms, ability. Telesur has the ability to set up a social media account. Everyone has the ability. I've, everyone has the voice to speak. Everyone is able to speak and say something. Uh, compared to audience, to whom am I speaking? And how directly am I speaking? Right now, I'm speaking to you almost one-on-one. -on -one. Direct communication compared to what we're calling mediated communication that is at a remove. So Twitter, their television station, one level removed. Twitter, their Twitter videos and things like that, another step removed. So we're, we will be thinking about this distance. How far away am I from my audience? We talk about the right to do something or the freedom to do something. The right of Telesur to have a social media account is, however, defined by private corporations, conglomerations of nation states governing data transmission, the terms and conditions, not of its laws, not of its constitution, but the agreement that you click on when you go on Twitter or you go on Facebook. So the right, when, we, when, I, see, when I see this on Twitter or I see this on Facebook, freedom of speech, I question it. In, based on what? Um, just as a bit of an aside, I started up a while ago an account called Kamal Shafi. It was, about, it was a bot on Twitter. It went through the Twitter accounts, it found phrases, it searched on particular phrases, called them forward and called them out. It was closed down at least seven times. I've had it reopened. Finally, Twitter said you are you are working against you are working against our community. The account comes down, and they took it down. So just to talk about the platform or the media, the medium that we're referring to, ideas of freedom of speech stop existing. Privilege is something different. Privilege means, okay, I may have the right to say something, but I might prevent myself from saying it based on the community I'm in, or how people feel in terms of uh, a group or community, uh, and that kind of thing. And then finally, the luxury. This often comes with ideas of class. If I'm of a, a per particular class status, I have the luxury to stand above everything and uh, do what I want. So here, the conclusion, Telesur, the national television company of Venezuela has the ability, but not the right, nor the privilege, nor the luxury to have a Facebook page. Okay, so we're going to compare this to the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, a white supremacist group. They have the ability, as well as the right, as well as the luxury, Perhaps not the privilege, meaning perhaps they shouldn't be marching through black communities or other communities that are sensitive to what they have to say. The Ku Klux Klan in the United States is painted as a minority, but we can see in terms of the dominant culture, they're actually part of the hegemonic discourse. They're part of the dominant cultural mode, and we can even refer to uh, what allows them to march as being structural structural to uh, the country itself. Here, this is a, an analysis of source, gesture, basis, and frame. On the right, I have some questions. We're going to be looking at a, uh, an organization in the UK. We'll be an, we'll, we will be analyzing their their efforts. They do things like, uh, it's called positive negatives. They put artists with Syrian refugees in Europe, for example. And you can start to see in their, 
in their pages uh, a narrative outside of what they claim to be talking about. So these questions, where does the idea come from, but later, what narrative does it serve? What media were used to produce this project? What costs were involved? And who is able to participate? We can analyze uh, projects based on this idea of substance. And this brings me to uh, part of my research, especially here in, Le in Lebanon. What are, the, what are the expressions that go unnoticed or unremarked because they are not part of the dominant discourse. They are not seen as being valid. They are seen as being uh, outside. And I have a quote here by Audre Lorde. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Okay? Um, that's the presentation. Uh, what I'd like to do is This is the website for positive negatives. Rania, maybe we can break everyone into groups like we did before. <laughs> you were great at that. <laughs> How many are we?
There's a worksheet here, it looks like this. It has some boxes to fill in with definitions of terms. And if you, if you can, if you have your Wi-Fi going on your phone, the website is up here, positivenegatives.org. There are two pages that I would ask you to look at, if you can. One is stories, and the other is called About Us. It looks like this. We're going to, I would, what I would like to do is go through, I know it was a very quick presentation and it's a vocabulary that uh, deserves a little bit more time, but I just want us to go through a little bit and start to think about what these terms mean in the sense that this website, Positive Negatives, is positioning itself as a, I will, let's not say resistant, let's say alternative narrative. We are embedding artists with refugee groups, for example. We are sending artists to different parts of the world and we are asking them to interview people and turn those interviews into graphic novels. Is this problematic for anybody in the room? <laughs> And if so, why? Let's start there, perhaps. Is there any, we're talking again, we're talking about distance from original voice. We're talking about things like um, who gets to speak, in what medium, this kind of thing. Any, is, any questions or issues that might come up? Anybody? Go ahead. So maybe if you say that we are the ones who interview people, and so then we are the ones who paint the, the graphic novels about what they said, so we would be the ones who tell their story for them or about them, so that might be problematic, depending on how much we talked with them about their story and how much they told us, and yeah. Okay, so, so taking what is original voice and translating it or turning it into a, a secondary, um, secondary narrative or a different narrative. Okay, the question, if we think about, if we think about the idea of an artist from, let's say, the West, an artist from Europe, an artist from uh, the United States, an artist from Canada, this organization sends them to Germany, there are Syrian refugees collected in a group there. The artist comes in, starts interviewing people. The artist is asking questions and the questions are being answered. Those refugees in the camps are not making graphic novels, but the artist is taking what they say from their language, putting it into a different language. Is this problematic? And if so, why? Go ahead. Uh, in my opinion, this is not prob problematic because they are um, influencers. When they go back and they speak about what, ha what they have seen and what they have interviewed, uh, they could, uh, in a way or another, they could um, 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 يستطيعوا أن ينقلوا أو يتحدثوا بصورة أو باسم هؤلاء الأشخاص ويعبروا عن معاناتهم لأنهم أشخاص مؤثرين يعني بمعنى آخر عندنا في الأردن مخيم اللجوء السوري اللي هو الزعتري جاء العديد من المشاهير من أمثال أنجلينا جولي وعندما عادت 
وتحدثت تحدثت بشكل مؤثر وهذا كان له دور بارز في تسليط الضوء على الأوضاع والمشاكل التي يعاني منها المخيم Thank you Question That work That work is being produced Who is the audience? To whom is it directed? Is it directed back to Syrians in any way, shape or form at all? That's, a, that's a, like a follow-up question. I hear what you're saying. We're going to tease out. We're going to really work at where the problematic might be. Um, I think the problematic might also be that the resources that the um, American person is using to come over and tell the stories of the Syrian refugees. May, I mean, they could still use those resources, but in order to give the refugees the tools to tell their own stories. I think when they draw them, they risk stylizing them in Western ways and toning down the aesthetics that might be more important because it's coming from a different culture. So I think programs like that are maybe better if, instead of taking, coming, listening, and then going away, it's an entire ongoing project together with the refugees that would help them to tell their own stories, that would give them something to work on, especially if they're in an in-between camp or somewhere where they can't work or learn the language of the place that they are yet. So I think that would be maybe a less problematic way of okay. doing Okay, thank it. you. Let me follow up by this, and we're I'm just gonna keep pushing, okay? We're gonna be keep talking. I'm not negating anything anyone's saying, but we're gonna keep pushing till we, we get to the, the, the core of the matter, if you will. So here, can we imagine and those of you who were here for Rania's presentation, much of this is framed within an equivalent discourse, meaning there are two sides to a story. We're trying to find the other side. Okay, this is how this is often posited. Do we imagine Syrian refugees, and these include many of my friends from Ras al who, when the window of opportunity opened up to go to Europe, left. And Lebanese left with them. They don't have visas, they don't have passports. Uh, my neighborhood, Ras al here in Beirut, emptied of Shabab, emptied. People left. Do we imagine these people seeking asylum, seeking inclusion in Europe, are on an equal power differential with those interviewing them? Question. رأيي للأسف الشديد كثير من القصص اللي تقدم عن أوضاع اللاجئين لا تصف الواقع ولا تقدم فعلا فعلا قراءة دقيقة لما يجري وبالتالي يتم التعاطف مع اللاجئين من منطلق إنساني فقط ليس لأي دعم سياسي أو دبلوماسي أو ما فعلا يساعدهم على التخلص من مشكلتهم بشكل كلي هذا من جانب الجانب آخر حتى القصص اللي تروى أيضا تروى يعني بطريقة مجزوعة هو فعلا تركز فقط على الضحايا وعلى القتلى لكنها يعني لا ت يعني لا تخبرنا من الفاعل من الذي تحمل المسؤولية وبالتالي يعني هاي إشكالية كبيرة متوقعة نعم Okay, the, the comment for those, uh, there's no context, right? We're just assuming these people have arrived and there's no reason for them to, to be there other than they've arrived. There's no accountability. And it is presented as a humanitarian tragedy. Who caused it? What are the reasons for it? Somebody who is in a position where they have to speak based on the hope of getting into Europe, or getting into becoming a citizen of a European country. Do we imagine they're telling the truth? Question. في نقطة تاني تسنيدا لكلامك نقطة تاني أساسية. أنجلينا جولي وغيرهم لما بيجوا بيحسسونا بالشفقة حرامهم لجئين بيشجعونا نعمل شيء واحد 
خلينا نبعث مصاري لهالمؤسسات الاغاثيه اليو ان الاف اي او غيرهم هلا هالمؤسسات اكتشفت انه حوالي 90 ل 95% من المصاري اللي هن بحطوها على جنب لمساعده اللاجئين بتروح لاداره المساعده ومش للاجئين عم بحكي برقم فعلي 90 ل 95% يعني لكل 100 دولار بيوصل له اللاجئ حوالي 4 ل 5 دولار اوكي ف اذا اذا بدها تنحط القصه عن اللاجئ تيشجع الدعم لمؤسسه اللي عم تستفيد ماديا من لجوءه في اشكاليه وبرجع انا برايي كمان في اشكاليه من ناس بيجوا وعانيناها كثير بالمخيمات الفلسطينيه بلبنان بيجوا بيدرسونا صرنا مقر للدراسه بياخذوا منا وبينشروا هن وهن بيستفيدوا ماليا وماديا وبشهرتهم ونحن بس بقعه لل انه ليدرسونا ل... ل... يتفرجوا علينا مثل ك... كجيني بيجز ان لابراتوري سوري ل... للكلام الوقحي And it brings up an example of so our, our collective Jam Al Yad can I'm in the first time we went into Burj al Burajne, the tension was so thick. Why? Because we were the hundredth, we were the thousandth group coming through. And okay, another group of people coming to help, coming to assist, right? I had with me uh, an artist, Juan Fuentes, from Oakland in the United States, Mexican origin, grew up in the United States. My students tell me later, or the members of the collective told me later, you looked like you were about to have a hundred heart attacks, and it was true. All we wanted to do, we wanted to set up a warshe, al-amal, and, and work with them, um, but nobody wanted to do anything. When Juan Fuentes started speaking and his words were being translated into Arabic, so the words like labor camp, occupation, the war of an aggressor, the United States, the war against Mexico, um, the inability to cross the border, all of this resonated with uh, the Palestinian youth there and things started opening up. But the issue for us became how do we continue this? How do we make sure we're not just coming in one time, right? Setting up something, we walk away with street credibility, a resume, what do they have? After these graphic novels come out about Syrian refugees, what do the Syrian refugees have that they didn't have before? Or what has been lost? Throwing that out there as a question. And if we, if we go back to, if we, let me bring up, uh, there's one example. Dear Habib, and I'll read. Dear Habib brings to life the incredible challenges and opportunities, I'm sorry, pause. Opportunities that young unaccompanied migrants face. The animation follows Habib who journeyed to the UK from Afghanistan at just 14, and his, his experience of transitioning to adulthood. The project was commissioned by Becoming Adult, a three-year ESRC-funded project conducted with University College London. The animation was co-produced with Habib himself, alongside Majid Adin, the artist who created the official animation for and John's rocket man, okay. Um, what do we start to see? And this is one of the, this is one of the categories we're talking about, which is uh, source. Who is funding this? Who is putting forth the money for this, right? Um, if we go back to the About Us page, Meet Our Team, Ben worked as a communications manager for the United Nations 
Any red flags, any warning bells, any sirens go off at the mention of the United Nations? And various international NGOs across Asia and Africa for over 12 years. Ben was based in LTTE controlled Bani, North Sri Lanka, with the UN. LTTE, the Tamil rebels in Sri Lanka. He wasn't working with them, he was working with the United Nations there. Any comments, any questions? Do we, do we start to see anything problematic in terms of the idea of funding or who? Okay, let me ask it this way. Can we imagine the narrative that comes out of one of these graphic novels? How close what might we say it is to the Syrian experience? How close what might we say it is to foreign policy goals of a particular country or a particular group of countries? Anybody? مش عم تفهم السؤال ولا بدنا نحطها بغير اطار؟ اوكي اذا المقارنه انه هذا الشخص اذا بده يكون كثير واحد بن يمين اوكي بنجمن اللي كان خبرته كممثل للامم المتحده اوكي ب منطقه فيها صراع مسلح خلينا نكون انه صراع هلا مش عم نقول اي موقف بس في صراع مسلح وهو جاي من وجهه نظر الامم المتحده وخلينا ما نعتبر الامم المتحده كمؤسسه محيده اوكي ما لنا مؤسسه محيده خلي علاقتها بفلسطين والعراق كثير واضحه شو عملت فينا ما لنا مؤسسه محيدة. فهو كان عم بيمثل الامم المتحده بهيدي المنطقه وبعدين جاي حضرة جنابه من وجهه نظره جاي ياسس مجموعه بوزيتيف نيجاتيف اوكي اللي بتلعب على الصوره اللي بعدين بتبعت مشاهير ضيد طبعا تيجوا لعنا نحن كلاجئين سمر تياخذوا قصتنا ويفسروها للبيض فشو ممكن تكون وجهه نظره هو مسبقا قبل ما يجي يسالنا اي سؤال هو جاي عنده وجهه نظر معينه تركيبه معينه لروايتنا كلجوء فكيف بدها تتركب القصة اللي هو بده يقولها تيرجع يبعثها وشو الخطورة لما ناس عم يجوا مع هالمساحة الكبيرة من ال... كمساحة شهر شهرة يعني نحسب اجت مادونا هلا تجي على لبنان بقول شو بنعمل فيها بس نحسب تجي مادونا على مخيم للاجئين السوريين ب... ب... بالاردن أو تعرفت على اللاجئين السوريين بألمانيا وروية قصتهم مساحتها لإلا أكبر بكثير من أي مساحة نحن يمكن يكون عندنا إياها، فنعم انفلونسر بس شيء كثير خطير يكون حدا انفلونسر اللي ما عم بيقول قصتي بأسلوبي لأنه بعدين أنا لما بدي أقول روايتي بدي كذب روايتها تأرجع صيغ روايتي صار عندي صعوبتين مش صعوبة أختي ففي انه بس بدنا اياهم نكون واضحين كثير على الاشكاليات مين الشخص اللي عم يسال؟ شو جمهوره؟ شو تركيبته السياسيه الخلفيه السياسيه للسؤال؟ اوكي؟ وشو هدفه؟ ومين بينتج؟ ومين بيخسر؟ من كل هالتركيبه، اوكي؟ لما بيجوا على شيء كثير بريء اسمه اللجوء، طبعا ما في شيء بريء، اوكي؟ فانه بس خلينا نحن نفكك الموضوع خاصة انه هن ابنائنا اللي عم يعملوا معهم هالمقابلات اوكي وبعرف عنا رفاق من المانيا كمان عم يعملوا مقابلات بالمانيا في تركيبات 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 حتى كلمه مايجرنت منا صادقه هو لازم تكون لاجئ ومش مايجرنت مايجرنت شخص عنده الاختيار يسافر انا جدي اختار يسافر من صالي مع امريكا اختار ما حدا ضربه على ايده اوكي هؤلاء الاشخاص ما عندهم الاختيار يا وضعهم الاقتصادي يا السياسي يا الاجتماعي جابرهم 
يا بيسافروا يا بيموتوا في وضع اقتصادي كمان مش بس سياسي اوكي فحتى المصطلحات اللي تستخدم بدنا نفككها ونكون كثير كثير حريصين فهذا اللي عم بجرب يفرجينا يا دانيال انه قدين نحن بدنا نكون حريصين ما بكفي انه تجي انجلينا جولي ونفتح لها المساحه مين بتكون شو رؤيتها حتى لو نيتها طيبه في مثل بامريكا you know the road to hell is paved with good intentions ف نيه ما بتكفي طريق لجهنم طريق جهنم هو طريق النيه الصافيه ما بتكفي النيه مهم الخلفيه جاستي في في سد في لا خلي هو المايك معي هو احنا المشكله كمان عندنا بطريقه عرض القضيه دكتوره ومستر هلا المشكله كمان بالتوجيه الجماهير لهذا الموضوع انه صاروا يعاملوا انت عم تفهم علي؟ اه انهم صاروا يعاملوا اللاجئين كمان كارقام يعني هو آه نسي انه هم لهم ذوات ولهم عوائل ولهم احلام زيهم زي اي شيء فهو بالتالي عم بيجي على المخيم مخيم اللجوء ايش ما يكون وعم بفترض بصورته النمطيه هو انه هذا اللاجئ تحت ظرف معين هو مظلوم او غير مظلوم اجى بس هو بالنهايه عم بيعامله كرقم بروباغندا يعني انا عم بشوف احيانا عم تتحول الامور الى بروباغندا اعلاميه انه احنا عم نيجي ولا زلنا مهتمين بالقضايا الانسانيه واولهم قضايا اللجوء لكن عم بيعامله كرقم ما عم بيعامله كانسان ما عم بيعامله كهويه سياسيه وطنيه فهي اكثر المشاكل اللي عم نواجهها عندنا بالاردن في م... عندنا في الاردن في مقيمات لجوء من فلسطين، في عندنا مقيمات لجوء من سوريا. بصراحه صارت موضوع المخيمات اللجوء يعني زي ماده اعلاميه يعني انا اسف بس اللي بده ينجح بانتخابات معينه صار يروح على مخيم لجوء، اللي بده ينشهر في مكان معين صار بده يروح على مخيمات لجوء. حتى صار الموضوع يعني مؤذي لهم شخصيا، اللاجئ صار يطلع على هاي الناس اللي بتيجي زي كانه وحش، وحش جاي ينهش ما تبقى من الانسانيه يعني. فان شاء الله اكون انا فاهم الزاويه اللي عم نحكي فيها فان شاء الله انه نستطيع نطلع من هذا الموضوع نبطل نعامل اللاجئ كرقم ونصير نعامله كانسان ونبطل هاي البروباغندا اللي عم نشتغل عليها. We're talking about symptoms of a problem. And the problem is much bigger. And the context for it is much more complex. And we get to the end of the, whether, they are, whether there, are, there are refugees in uh, Jordan or here in Lebanon, or they've made their way, I have many friends now in Europe, they're not necessarily happy. They're waiting for residency and all of that kind of thing. Um, Can we imagine a graphic novel coming from this group that talks about what happened before or what happened that led up to this that might talk about, we're talking about uh, an organization in the United Kingdom. Can we imagine anyone? Do we imagine Dr. Benjamin Dix, anyone on this list of people talking about England's role in what happened, or Europe's role in what happened, or the American pressure, foreign policy. Do we imagine that any of the questions that are posed to refugees in the camps include, what do you think about American foreign policy as regards Syria? Huh? I think, we, 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 and going back to the, I like the comment, you know, we talk about someone who is an influencer. What percentage of the population do we imagine this person reaching, right? I often say to my students, your Facebook realm, your Twitter realm, your Instagram realm, a world unto itself. Right? And going back to this, this idea of mediation, what we see on Instagram, do we imagine this to be real life? 
or is it mediated? Is there a distance there? Um, Rania was talking in her presentation about um, uh, young people in the camps now putting together their own videos, um, working with their own uh, stories, their day to day, and there are websites for them now, and the, these are getting out there a little bit more. Maybe this is a little bit more, this shows a little bit more direct contact or direct voice or original voice, we might say, South Aslam. Does that clear up that a little bit? So we're, I think part of the issue is we are so used to, we are so used to this bubble. And going back to the idea of being or imagining ourselves not colonized, and I include myself in this category. I grew up acculturated in the United States. I, I admit that and spent much of my life fighting against that. Um, but assuming that there are universals, that there is one opinion, that there is one way of thinking throughout the whole world. Home di Lubnan, yani is and the kind second bi rasa naba, matalan. Hadna bi ashrafiye alam tani. Completely different world. Language is different. The way of being is different. But that's not a critique or a judgment. I'm just saying, if we're if we're talking fakafe bi Lubnan or fakafe Lubnaniye, what are we talking? Hamus? Are we talking chabas? What are we talking? Right? Is it that flag? We break it down into a lot of different, uh, we break it down into what are considered universals. But then we can even take a step back and say, Shuhu'e Lubnan, this nation state that came into existence, right? Before we said, Bilad Sham, right? It's an idea which is still, still carries political weight today. كنت بدي أشير لنقطة مهمة إنه مش بالضرورة إنه يجي شخص إنفلونسر from outside حتى يفوت على إن ال ال الأماكن المستهدفة لنقل الصورة إلى الخارج أحيانا ممكن إنه يقعد يلعب الموفي ميكينج دور في هذا الموضوع أذكر إنه في نادين لبكي حازت على ترشيح للجرامي أوورد I I think أو الجولدن جلوب أوورد ونجحت في إيصال الفكرة عن دور أو كيفية كيف يعيش الطفل الفلسطيني داخل مخيمات اللجوء الفلسطيني وكان لها تأثير كبير في 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 هذا الإطار أعتقد أنها ترشحت لجائزة الأوسكار فلما تترشح مثل هاي الأفلام ويطلع عليها أكبر عدد ممكن من الأشخاص اللي بهمهم يطلعوا على الثقافة اللي بتعاني منها المخيمات اللجوء الفلسطيني ممكن أنها ترسم صورة واضحة عما يحدث وممكن أنه الديبيت اللي يصير بعد مشاهدة هذا الفيلم تتوضح الصورة بشكل أفضل سواء من الجانب الفلسطيني أو من الجانب الآخر اللي أنتج وأخرج هذا الفيلم شكرا بالنسبة تحديدا للقضية الفلسطينية كون هو يعني أطول قضية وأطول صراع في المنطقة الآن في تجارب يعني ما ما ذكرته زميلتي الآن التجارب يعني صارت أكثر وعيا فعلا لتقديم القضية الفلسطينية وشرح اللجوء والحقوق الفلسطينية الضائعة والمنتهكة يعني بطريقة فعلا منطقية ومن أصحاب القضية لأنه دائما يقال إنه صاحب القضية هو الأقدر على حملها وتوصيلها للناس يا بدنا جوليا بطرس ولا بدنا جوليا أنجيلا فا يعني هاي هي القضية بس هسه الآن اللجوء السوري واللجوء اليمني مثلاً لغاية الآن لسه يعني جديد وحديث فاحنا بنتمنى إنه ما يستمر ويطول فعلاً زي اللجوء الفلسطيني لأنه راح تكون يعني مشكلة مضاعفة صار صرنا بحاجة إنه يعني كل كل لاجئين إنهم يكونوا سيخاف وصفة يعني وطننا العربي كله كله لاجئين وبالمناسبة يعني أكثر اللاجئين هم من الوطن العربي يعني هيك الإحصائيات العالمية بتقول إنه هي مشكلة اللاجئين أغلب اللاجئين هم عرب أو مسلمين حتى بالأحرى صحيح يعني مزبوط الرقم هذا 
So we have an, um, we live in an almost constant present. One of the, some of the factors that we talk about in our research and these questions, how do, and the reason I go back to the original decolonization movements and the liberation movements, what is the historical context for this? Are we reliving what has happened before without thinking or bringing forward what happened in the past? So people, people have a, um, a sense of the, the Syrian quote unquote crisis without understanding how many waves of immigrants have come from this region and gone to other places. But only seeing the, the, the waves of people, and we mentioned the word humanitarian before, but again, taking a step back and realizing how many people are familiar with the organization USAID? Anybody in the room? USAID, okay. If you go down to AUB, go into the offices there, the furniture is all marked with a sticker, a gift of the American people. Yeah, that was my reaction too. I was, uh, when I would work on campus and I would ask, can I take this sticker off? Can I remove this please? And the answer was no. They come in and they audit and they see whether the stickers are still there. <laughs> and that determines whether more aid comes. Imperialism in the old days used to be about armies, occupation, economic uh, taking away of resources. Now it comes in the form of aid and assistance and breaking into a market. And now that you have all American photocopy machines and office chairs and all of this stuff, when this breaks, you need to come back to us, right? So this bigger picture of, of the, the uh, they even use the term humanitarian imperialism or working with, working with uh, ideas of what is the narrative that's being built? So if we look at, my computer went off. Um, sorry guys, thanks. If we look at this organization, and again, I'm bringing this up as a means of analysis in the sense that I agree, I agree absolutely that there is a much bigger picture that there are, in, I can talk to my, my Syrian friends who are now in Europe and I can hear them striving to make it. They want to be there, they want to get their citizenship. <laughs> What can we do? What is there to do? This means of analysis is, is a way of examining voice. Who's speaking? Who has the right to speak? Who governs that language? Who controls the media, right? If we look at these graphic novels that are coming out of this organization, printed in English, printed for a UK audience, for example, what is the result of that? What ends up being the, um, the end picture? Do we imagine the United States has, or the UK has, the Syrian people in its heart or in its mind in the hope of, once we, let, once we have this voice come out, we have done something beneficent or charitable, right? And can we imagine that these graphic novels really represent a given voice? I go back to what we were saying over here before. What would be different, and here's a question perhaps, what would be different if you were to give people the tools to make their own graphic novels? Can we imagine a different story coming out perhaps? Our work in Burj al Brezhne was to, not to go in and say, here is how you should think, or here is what you should say. This is how you do silkscreen. This is how you do a linoleum print. 
This is how you might make your own posters, tying into traditions and ways of working that exist. But then again, we learn so much from them as well that I see it more as a, as a back and forth. Um, questions? I was, um, yeah, I was just wondering because if we talk about this and we talk about this is something by the people from the UK, I think we need to distinguish because I think we're making it too easy if we say, okay, this is the peop this is the refugees, this is the people from the UK, this is yeah. the Americans, I don't know. So I think we, well, if we think this way, we're not gonna find, like we're not gonna get anywhere because we're making two big groups and we don't see people and we don't see, well, thoughts about behind it. So I think even though this is really problematic to do it this way and to make a web page like that and everything that we should also think about, okay, maybe still this is a message for to maybe get more people into, into politics and everything. And no, I, I agree, I agree, and I should be very clear when I say the U when I say the UK as an entity, I'm more often speaking about foreign policy, right, and a, a, a governing body or a dominant body, right? I mean, there's more support for Palestinians in Dublin and other places in Ireland than much of those islands. Does that make sense? Like, I know that this, this interrelationship exists, and I know that there's a bridging of causes between um, here and there. And actually, this goes back to the idea of liberation movements where that was all, that was the goal. It wasn't just, this is our liberation battle here in this country, but how do we support those also doing this in other places? So I take your, your, your point very well, and, and thank you for that. Question over here? Actually, I can't describe about feeling of Syrian people who left Syria during the war to the Jordan. Because usually the person with his position, the actor, the fashionista, the influencer, uh, he usually asks and he usually answer. The reality and the image of uh, Syrian people, we don't listen to him. Say the first part again. The first paragraph. Yeah. Uh, we didn't describe the feeling of Syrian people. Before the war. What? Before the war, yeah. Yeah, okay. Who left the Syria during the war, come to Jordan. Okay. Usually the person who visit him in Jordan, usually he ask and he, he answer. We don't listen to him. Usually we don't listen to Syrian people in Jordan and another uh, nationality. Mm -hmm. That's the big problem. We don't have an image about her life in Jordan. Can we imagine, historically speaking, a time when there was common cause, or there was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Bridging or connecting, right? We've come to a, we've come to a position where crises pile up one on top of another, and we're left with only being able to think about things in a very, competitive way, us over them, me over somebody else, right? How do we get back to, part of this project is very much about how do we go back to a way of thinking that precludes this? How do we go back to a time, and I don't mean go back as if things were perfect before, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that right now, the tools we use, when I, okay, I'm old enough to remember when the internet was invented. So that was only in the early 90s, for those of you who grew up with it and understand it to be ever existing and only that, and it becomes our whole lives. Before, the, before that means of communication came into being, it was promised to be a way of bridging. It was going to bring everybody together. It was going to allow anybody to talk to anybody else. And very quickly, I think, as the years went by, we saw corporations consolidating um, information, 
the dissemination of information, how uh, history was told, and now we have a few companies controlling not just the information and the news, but how our information travels. There were some weird situations when I was living in Lebanon. All of a sudden, the cables under the ocean were being cut. Do you remember? I don't know if anybody remembers this. All of a sudden, oh, there's no internet because the cables connecting us to Europe and other places have been cut. Do you remember that? That was in, I would say, 2000, 2010, maybe? The rumor, the conspiracy theory, because we're good at that, was that they wanted to force all of the communication up into the satellites so that they could retrieve and, and keep hold of it and that kind of thing. To me, it made sense. But at the same time, what the point I'm trying to make is when our means of working, when our tools are owned and controlled by few, our way of speaking or our way of saying things is much more limited. And yet, those who control the tools tell us, you have freedom, you have freedom of speech. Everyone can go on the internet and say whatever they want, right? And the, the, the website that I'm pointing to today, it's just one example. I bring it up because I think it has very particular contradictions between what it's attempting to do and what it actually does. In the sense that by saying I'm going down to this level and pulling up voice from this level, the, the actual purpose is to speak of a narrative that is up here, to spin a narrative of and whatever one may feel about those in power in Syria right now, a narrative of overturning a sovereign nation. I bring up the Venezuela example because it's the same thing. The United States hoping to foment, quote unquote, regime change in Venezuela. And these aren't two new examples. I mean, this is a constant, constant, constant thing. It's part of our history, it's part of the history of the global south. And so when we see, I think, I think also the issue becomes for us, when we see ourselves represented in the West, quote unquote, the West, when we see ourselves represented, we feel, oh, okay, that's me, that's my voice. I'm now part of this discussion, but I think we need to be um, careful what is that portrayal? Who is it portraying? To whom is it speaking? What is it saying? And so these tools are ways of really digging down into, okay, and here, I'll bring up this example. So I'm teaching at a university in, in Canada, and the dean of another faculty came to our department, illustration department, and said, Here's this group, positive negatives. It would be great to work with them. And I, was, I looked them up, and I looked at all this information. All I did, I sent an email, and I said, can we meet? <laughs> can we talk about this? There are some huge problems with source, with funding, with who these people are, and what it is they're trying to say. And all I want to do is talk about it. The email that came back, started in, it was this long. And it was referring to me in the third person. Daniel is, how did it go? Daniel is uh, bringing us a liberal narrative of, no, 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 okay, you just called me a liberal, how do I respond? Um, beyond that, uh, basically saying there are two sides to every story, and you're saying one thing, we want to show the other side. I was up for, this is the dean, right? So there's this power differential. How do I respond to the dean of, uh, in my university? And I eventually wrote up an email and I said, what I want to discuss has nothing to do with my career, my academic trajectory, uh, my theoretical or philosophical position. It has everything to do with those I know who used to be in Lebanon from Syria who have left and whose livelihood 
has been put into turmoil by efforts such as this. And there was an apology, well, a kind of half-hearted apology. My point being that if I compare where she was coming from and where I was coming from, it became a very Canadian thing. It was this, this idea there are two sides to each story and we're going to um, bring forward the other side, but only if it gives us the narrative that we're already spinning in the dominant discourse, if that makes sense. So at that point, at this point, um, the work we do, the, the, this method of analysis, when my students now come forward and they say, I want to work on this project, I want to work with this community, I want to do, uh, and we have words for it, um, awareness campaigns, right? Uh, this kind of thing, where we talk about, okay, we're gonna do some posters to make people aware of a situation. It's like, okay, stop. We're talking about somebody. How do we talk with them? How do, how do we get to their voice? Whatever the case may be. I bring up, I bring up the Syrians, the Syrian refugees, only as, in, a, in a way to speak of something that is current. And like we were saying before, forgetting all of the other groups that have migrated or the reasons for their migration. What I hope to do with this uh, kind of analysis is to really allow us to take a step back, really start to question what are our preconceived ideas? What are our, what has been inculcated? What has been um, set in our minds as a way of looking at the world. And so I, I admit that <clears throat> it's often hard to like, to pull away, take a look at the big picture and start working with that on that level. Um, but I think as you're, as you're working, whether you're working on a journalism piece or a story about a particular person or group, or if you're working as a uh, culture, working on some kind of culture, whether it's a movie or a theater play or uh, posters or whatever the case may be. There are ways of anal analyzing our work, our way of working, and making sure that we're not falling into a trap where we're, we're becoming part of a dominant narrative. Does that make sense? Any other questions or comments? I don't know how we are with time. We have about 40 minutes. Okay. Sorry? And if there aren't, I, I have some examples of student work. If anyone's, in, if you're interested, I can show some of the student work that was produced based on these ideas. If, uh, yeah? Someone has a question. Question? Go but ahead. my question was essentially, you're essentially about to answer it, so. Say again? Oh, you're essentially about to answer it. I just wanted to know um, more examples of ways that we can work with okay. people with that. A good segue. Um, these are from, I'll go through these quickly, uh, but just to, for each, for each project, down below we see what the uh, ideas behind the project were in terms of how the students were working. These first projects are from AUB. They told me a workshop and not a presentation, so but I'm, we'll go through these. So here, this was for a book cover, illustrated book cover, and I had the students analyze uh, working with stories and narratives from the Global South, so uh, authors from global, the Global South and global diasporas, um, but getting away from what, how they were trained, meaning Renaissance perspective, getting away from ideas of rendering and quote unquote drawing realistically really working with uh, this idea of multiple focus that we see in 
local cultural practice, whether miniatures, carpets, patterns, this kind of thing. Uh, usually in Beirut, when this comes up as a graphic design project, the idea is let's imagine the Olympics coming to Beirut. How would we, how would we do those graphics? And what usually happens is students go looking at ideas of Phoenicianism and that kind of thing, and they start putting together um, very particular ideas. But no one questions, well, what are the Olympics? The fact that the Olympics comes from a very uh, fascist perspective, that the Olympic Games are used as a means to, quote, clean up cities of its unwanted, the homeless and the poor. So we studied, this was during the London Olympics in 2012, we studied protest movements and the graphics that were produced by them, and we studied uh, city, group, uh, city Olympic committees and the graphics that they produced, and the students put together some uh, posters that were instead focusing on ideas of gentrification and displacement. This was a project, how to design a radio for a community of people who might not be literate, who might not be able to read, who want to get their voice heard, um, but have, don't have the acculturation of visual literacy that we might have. So I took the engineering students at AUB and I brought them together with the graphic design students they built radios, and then they ended up building these uh, project kits. Um, this was a project in asking the students to visit a neighborhood in Beirut that they didn't know, which put everyone in a panic, because most students were, they knew where they lived, and they knew Hamra here, or, or down a little bit further, where the university is but they had never ventured out for very, you know, we're talking reasons having to do with comfort zones and where I'm comfortable and where I walk based on who I know and how I know them. And so the, the idea was how do we bridge? And so the idea was take, find a friend in that community or that part of Beirut, go in, document, and this was a student, Farah Sleiman, she went into Sabra, um, and did this, it was a uh, magazine feature story. <laughs> Here in Lebanon, uh, there are dozens and dozens of local crafts completely undone by commercial capital reasons. And so for this project, the students would pick one group of crafts, and they had to produce a newsletter, but it involved uh, working with particular communities and working, uh, interviewing particular people. And, but again, considering the audience, not taking these crafts and producing it in English, producing it in a language that a minority of the country can understand, but producing it in a language that um, everyone can understand, or those that speak the national language. This was a project working with proverbs, uh, Lebanese proverbs, taking them, really working. It, it impressed me a lot that the local proverb that local proverbs are used as an active part of the language. Um, this isn't necessarily necessarily the case for my American English example. Um, and they were to take a, a, a social issue and take the proverb and kind of mix them together a little bit and speak of something based on the various meanings that you can find in the local language. So a kind of localization and speaking, using local language to those locally. Here, this project evolved over the years. At first, I just said, pick a cultural figure. And for some reason, I don't know why in Beirut, or I don't know why here at AUB, everyone chose Marilyn Monroe or Charlie Chaplin. I couldn't figure out, like, why these two people? So I, fo I, I forced it to be, pick a cultural figure that is of any of the languages that are spoken in the country. And that kind of changed the parameters a little bit. 
but also for many of the students who were acculturated outside of Arabic, we worked with, squ with square Kufic lettering as a way to bring them back, as, a as an entryway back into a language that many of them had uh, been acculturated out of. This was a project based on a news story where uh, an activist from Iraq, he went, he, he went to get on a plane, he had a t-shirt that read, we will not be silent in Arabic. They didn't understand what the shirt said, but they refused to allow him on the plane with that shirt on, and their, their justification was, we wouldn't let you go into a bank with that shirt, maybe it says something about robbing the bank. That was the, the justification. So I asked the students to uh, work in a medium that requires a lot of really quick working. Um, what are their, what are, what ideas uh, does this bring up? What emotions do, does this bring up? And so we started talking about their ability to channel emotions such as anger, uh, for example, which are often in a colonized place not allowed. Here we have a project which was used to map a poet, the life of a poet. When I first got, when, when I first came back in 2004, I was really struck by the, the difference in navigating. So it wasn't a map of streets. There's only one official map of Beirut, which is the electric company's map, because they want to know who's paying them and how. But there was, a way of referencing things that was historical. So people wouldn't say, turn left at such and such a place, turn left where such and such a theater used to be. So kind of dealing with cultural memory and dealing with ideas of how do we see space? How do we work with um, where we are? And so the students were asked to put together maps of a poet's life that read, locally. This was a, a class where, where we, getting back to the comment before about speaking of, say, the UK as a conglomerate of people, for example, um, really working with other uh, resistant movements and that kind of thing. And the students would, part of the, part of the, part of the, um, Syllabus was the screening of movies that showed these different, different types of uh, activist movements around the world, and the students had to design a poster for um, each of the movies. And it brought up interesting intersections. So incident at Olala, for example, was uh, about indigenous populations in the United States, and it brought up discussions of Palestinians. When I got to Emily Karn in Vancouver, my student body shifted and changed. It was a little bit more internationally based, a lot of students from uh, various parts of Asia, for example. And so I was trying to adapt what I was teaching in Beirut to what they were, what we were teaching at uh, Emily Carr. And this project was about, again, going back to narratives of migration, immigration, and diaspora experiences, because many of the students could very much relate to those ideas and um, put a lot more into their work for that reason. In Canada, we talk a lot about indigenous perspectives or non-Western or pre-Western perspectives, and so this was a project that uh, explored local ideas of plants and plant life. This was a class, the basis of the class was resistant and protest art. And for many of the students to tell them that they were allowed to work in their native language or to work in their original language was news to them. The expectation was that they work in English, we're in Canada. And I said, well, no. <laughs> if you're more familiar with uh, your own language and want to work with that, please do. And these are just three examples. So the, the Molka, which is phonetically translated from the Korean, 
This was a project protesting what was happening in what is happening in Korea at the moment and which is causing a lot of protests, which is people putting cameras in private places such as bathrooms and then taking that video and putting it online. Um, the, the, the middle one was about the uh, murder of women in Mexico and how to um, protest against that. The N1 minus comes from the Spanish, ni una menos, not one less. And so playing with language in a way that only a Spanish speaker might understand. And then the last one is in uh, Mandarin and talking about the policy in China of one child. And I, I, thought, this was, I thought this piece was pretty incredible. The, the characters, the ideograms as a whole, both black and blue, speak of reproductive rights, but the blue by itself reads domestic animal. So kind of working with the idea of um, women's rights within that context. Series of posters, again, working with original languages. Um, how am I speaking? To whom am I speaking? And those are the examples I have. So kind of showing how, especially in this class, much of what they did was working with the readings I gave you today, how to, how to analyze my message, how to analyze how I put it together, how to take what I want to say and make sure that somebody cannot take it and change it or co-opt it or have it mean something other than what my intention is. Was that helpful? <laughs> But can you repeat the specific idea in the first design? So this is, this, this is working with local indigenous language. So this is a phonetic translation of um, this part of British Columbia, what we call British Columbia today in the Squamish language. It's working with the idea of those forms at the top are the gas and oil pipelines that they're building across Canada right now. So it's a protest against the, the pipelines that are being built with the idea that it's affecting nature, it's affecting our sea life, it's affecting uh, all of us in terms of uh, where we are now. So again, obviously, you and I aren't familiar with this language. It speaks in a particular way, but in putting us outside of it, it says something extra or beyond, if you will. Well, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>